Well, thanks for joining us today. Um, so I'm going to talk about some work we've been doing on the Cloncurry Metal Project. Um, and just a shout out to my co-authors there. Um, so what this project is, um, is basically um, we start off with an entire mineral system. We go and sample a whole bunch of deposits. Um, we get somewhere between maybe uh, 50 to 200 samples per deposit. And they're these little two centimeter paleomagnetic cores here um, up in the corner there. So and on each of these samples, we will basically do a whole bunch of different techniques. So a whole bunch of petrophysics, um, remnant magnetization, susceptibility, density, et cetera. And we couple that um, with um, mineralogy. So we, we do TEMA scans, uh, we do geochemistry and hyperspectral. Um, and I guess the idea, we generate Thank a you. lot of... Yeah. Sorry, quick one, mate. We're not seeing your screen at the moment. So you might just screen, share your screen again. Oh, hang on. Share. Do you see that? You can see your PowerPoint now, yep. Can you see that now? I uh, can still just see your um, PowerPoint screen rather than... Oh, okay, I'm sharing, I'm sharing the wrong screen. Um, wait a second, how do I change that? Uh, um, Jimmy, either either put on the PowerPoint, have the PowerPoint running, and then share that PowerPoint that's running, or actually just share your desktop, the desktop that you you, you know your main screen. It'll be called something like Screen One or Screen Two, rather than choosing PowerPoint. Sharing the screen. Oh, sorry, folks. Um, Screen one. Okay, is that working? No, you might need to unshare and then reshare. Now you've started the PowerPoint. And yeah, choose screen one. Screen two. Okay, is that it up? Yep. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I should have checked this beforehand. Um, anyway, so the idea of collecting all this data um, is that it's all aimed to go into a sort of machine learning um, approach so we can basically try and figure out all the different interrelationships between these different data sets. Um, the other thing that we want to do um, is basically use um, these different data sets together. So combine these different data sets in different ways so we can develop different tools. So there might be geophysical tools, petrophysical tools, structural tools. Um, what I'm gonna be talking about today is basically this overlap between our mineralogy as defined by TEMA, petrophysics, and then the implications for geophysics. So we're looking at a geophysical tool today. Um, and I'm gonna basically be working with the database we have um, at present. I guess the ultimate vision is that we want to learn things um, about the mineral system that we can um, then go and develop um, tools for, for handheld devices such as you see here that can be used in the core shed. Um, so we want to learn things about the mineral system that you guys can take out into the field um, and detect using fairly simple instruments. So today's objective, I'm basically going to um, examine the pitch physical evolution of a system relative to the metasomatic evolution of a system. So it's quite generalized and I'm really only going to be looking at magnetic susceptibility and density, um, but it's really just to give you an, an example of how you might use some of this data. So most of you will know Cloncurry, um, a lot of you will know Cloncurry. Um, it's up in uh, Northwest Queensland. Um, it's famous for iron oxide copper gold deposits, um, but really it's quite diverse. So we have iron oxide copper gold deposits, iron sulfide copper gold systems, and we have sort of VMS broken hill type systems, and also scarns and carbonate hosted deposits. So these deposits are mineralogically, geochemically, structurally, and geophysically very diverse. Um, so you can see that here. This is just a plot of susceptibility versus density. 
And you can see you have very magnetite rich deposits such as Ernest Henry here, um, varying up to sort of Swan, E1 and Osborne, uh, which has susceptibility up around two in some parts of the ore um, and densities getting up towards sort of 4.8. Other, other parts of um, this mineral system are very um, pyrite, pyrotite, and hematite rich. And so these basically have very negligible um, magnetic signatures. So you can think about um, this as being a series of separate mineral systems, or you can think about it as being one large interconnected mineral system. And that's kind of where I want to go today. Um, so it's kind of like this uh, reactive transport model, I guess, that people like uh, Louise Corvu um, are proposing uh, for the Big Bear um, system in Canada here. And I guess uh, I'm not the best person to speak to this, um, but it's basically um, you have an alteration system where um, each time you alter the host rock, you're creating a fluid. That fluid can precipitate some kind of mineralization. Um, the whole process, you're basically um, creating porosity, um, which allows more fluid to come through. So the, the fluid evolves um, um, throughout the system, and so does the, the petrophysical properties. So Tobias Schlegel, uh, who's working in uh, my team on this, um, is working um, on the Cloncurry version of this kind of process at the moment. So this is, uh, this is just a bit of a vague overview, I guess. Um, so results, how does progressive overprinting affect geophysical signature? Let's start off with the earliest style of mineralization, uh, sorry, uh, alteration. So here we've seen uh, pretty classic sodic alteration. Um, so you've brought in sodium and created albite. Um, it's also associated with titanite and magnetite. And what's happening here, you're removing um, potassium and pretty much just about everything else out of these rocks and all you're leaving is basically albite. So it's 80% albite. In terms of the petrophysical properties, you can see relatively low density, um, but it can have quite a bit of magnetite. So whilst most of it is down in this part, the bottom corner of this plot of susceptibility versus density, it is getting up to susceptibilities of around one. Um, and all of it is magnetite. Um, so as an output of this style of alteration, you're forming iron apatite deposits. And you can see here, uh, these are um, some of the samples that have greater than 1% apatite and greater than 5% magnetite. Um, this example here is pretty much 60% magnetite and uh, what 5% apatite. That's up here getting up to 1.8 SI. And you can see there's a real continuum from the, the albite alteration into the apatite um, magnetite alteration. So in terms of our sort of reactive transport model, this is the early part um, of this system, and it's fairly similar to what um, Louise has proposed for the Big Bear system. You're basically creating a lot of magnetite in the early part of this system. Um, in terms of the second stage of alteration, this is of, like often uh, proposed to be sort of synchronous with arbitization. Um, but it's basically you're bringing in calcium and magnesium um, and you're removing potassium and iron. Um, so you can see here in terms of the petrophysics, again, mostly low susceptibility. You are starting to get higher densities and that's mainly just because you're forming um, the amphiboles here, which have a higher density. But more or less, um, you still basically have fairly low density and low susceptibility. Now, where does all this uh, potassium and iron go? It goes into the next stage of alteration, um, which is biotite um, magnetite alteration. So you can see here the brown and the blue is overprinting the sort of light blue uh, and green, which is the sodic calcic alteration. And this is coming in over the top. Um, most of the time, it's much finer than that. So here you can see an albatite and you've got this fine biotite um, magnetite alteration over the top. Now, this alteration is in some way linked to the magnetite dominant ISCG mineralization. And it's also sort of laterally and or temporally related to biotite, uh, sorry, to K-Feldspar -Feld um, alteration. In terms of what it looks like geophysically, 
Um, it's quite a spread of these sort of biotype, magnetite alteration types, but in most cases, um, the one sitting under the magnetite trend here, um, you've, it's basically a bit of a melange of different types of alteration. Generally, it's sitting along this magnetite trend still. So you're still not getting to the point here where you're really oxidizing um, the magnetite in this system too much. Okay, so as we get into stage four, this is where we start to see K feldspar predominantly. Um, and this can, this will often tend to basically just overprint everything. Here, it's just partially overprinting this albite um, and potassic alteration, uh, albite and biotite alteration. As we go into the more sort of pervasive um, variants, you can see some of it is basically looking like a breccia here. Some of it kind of looks like an alter, altered um, volcanic. Um, these are plotting down the bottom here. Um, you can have quite a lot of magnetite associated with these, but here you actually start to come um, below this magnetite trend. And this is for two reasons. Um, you're basically now starting to um, oxidize this system. So you're starting to create hematite and pyrite and you're starting to destroy magnetite. Um, you're also starting to form some fairly serious copper mineralization at this point. Uh, and this can be sort of um, quite um, sort of relatively magnetite poor, I guess. So you can see large chunks of um, chalco pyrite in, in orange here, um, sitting in a sort of a vein um, with pyrite and um, calcite. Um, this is this background sort of almost overprinting this background um, uh, potassium alteration. You also can get some very uh, magnetite rich variants. Um, so this is sitting up here, susceptibility of almost um, two and a density up near 4.2. So in this case, you're coming off the magnetite trend probably mainly because you're adding the chalk and in. So um, this transitions then into sort of, uh, a sort of chlorite, quartz, hematite, calcite overprint. So you can see it's just partially overprinting the K feldspar alteration here. And what starts to ha really, really happen here is that um, you are oxidizing the system. So any magnetite that is in this system, you're now oxidizing it to hematite. And what that does in terms of petrophysics, this is, this is sort of a rare example where that's sort of um, the chlorite, uh, quartz, calcite hematite alteration has sort of gone to the full degree. It very rarely does, but um, it's basically reducing this magnetite trend here. You're starting to get down to the bottom where you've only got hematite uh, in the system, and that obviously has a very low susceptibility. So as the, the fluid evolves in this system, the petrophysics also evolve. So I just want to now try and put that into, um, I guess, um, the sort of structural context of Ernst Henry. So I just have a very simple um, magnetic model up here. Um, what you're seeing in the early part of the system, the distal footprint, um, you're basically seeing the sodic alteration, calcic alteration, and that basically um, occupies this entire gray zone. So basically the whole model area. Um, so um, as that goes on, as the, the system evolves, you're basically replacing the core of the system. Um, it has fairly low susceptibility, it's fairly low density. Okay, um, as you go into sort of the medial footprint, I guess, what you're seeing in the medial footprint and the Marshall shear zone um, is outlined here. You're seeing iron appetite alteration increasingly in the Marshall shear zone. Um, you're also seeing um, this biotite magnetite alteration. Um, so that's sort of sitting um, in brown here and the iron appetite is sitting in the pink. So um, these styles of alteration, the medial sort of footprint, if you will, primarily sit in the, in the Marshall, that should say Marshall shear zone, I think, but the Marshall shear zone, the hanging wall shear, to a lesser degree, the foot wall shear, um, and they're also sitting in parts of the breccia. 
Okay, as the system contracts further, so we're getting into the core of the system here, we've got potassic um, K feldspar alteration. Um, what's happening here is we're starting to oxidize the system. So we're dropping down off this sort of pure magnetite trend. Um, we're dropping down a little bit in terms of the potassic K feldspar alteration, but then the very last gasp, which only really overprints part of this system, um, you're basically seeing all magnetite destruction and you're forming um, hematite. There's still quite a lot of mineralization, mineralization associated with this last part of the system too, I should point out. So um, what's happening is as the system evolves, um, it's contracting um, into the middle and it's getting more and more oxidized. So you can see by the later stages up here, where you're getting silicification, you're getting closer to what you might see at um, Olympic Dam in terms of the mineral assemblages, you're starting to see hematite. Um, so the system is contracting and it's getting more and more oxidized. And this is kind of related to this figure, which I show all the time, which is kind of just looking at um, the, the different assemblages of magnetic minerals in the deposit. As you get more and more oxidized, um, you get less and less of a magnetic expression. Um, and basically what our system is doing, it's evolving from quite a reduced system into a much more oxidized system. And it's basically contracting as it does that. Um, so com some conclusions. Structural uh, and metasomatic evolution are coupled and together they control petrophysical properties and the petrophysical properties um, control the geophysical expression. Um, the magnetic mineral precipitation um, is controlled by, at a local scale, by temperature, um, pH, redox gradients. I talked about that on May 14, and I'm happy to give you that, uh, happy to give anyone uh, that talk if you'd like. Um, but it's also controlled by reactive transport, um, which is what we've been looking at today. So it's basically a system of overprinting metasomatic events. Um, if we look at IOCG systems, sort of through the reactive transport lens, the system evolves from reduced to oxidized assemblages. And this occurs as the system footprint gradually contracts. And, and you can use these principles um, when targeting in uh, potential field data, so regional potential field data. And the GSQ has been doing a good job of, of updating those data sets in the recent past. Um, you can also use um, these insights um, in the core shed um, with um, handheld tools. So you can map gradients um, in core using handheld tools. Um, and uh, that's all I have to say. So um, if anyone has a question, let it rip. Thanks, Jim. That was great. We do have... Um we do have a question in the Q&A. Uh, Murray Hutton is asking, at what stage does money come into the systems? Money, dollars as in pay dirt. Uh, yeah. yeah, so yeah, so you're starting to form, you, you do get significant um, copper early in the system. So the significant copper associated with the, the sodic calcium alteration and the iron appetite alteration. Um, and you do see in other parts of Cloncurry, um, you know, mineralization is associated with some of the scar uh, as well. But in the case of Ernest Henry, that's all been overprinted um, in the core of the system. So the majority of it is basically coming in um, when you're getting to the potassic alteration and then it's being modified after that. Um, and how do these systems compare with island arc porphyry systems? Well, I guess uh, what I'm suggesting is that there is a zonation. Um, there's a more or less concentric zonation present, and that's very similar to what you see in porphyry systems. Um, I think the difference you have here, um, I guess there's a different fluid, so um, the system is evolving in a different way. And in the case of Ernest Henry, um, you've got a fairly strong structural control, so you're not seeing that sort of pure concentric zonation. Parts of the system are picking up um, shear zones uh, primarily. So the, there is a, yeah, I mean, from a geophysical point of view, they are quite similar, but they're sort of same, same, but different. 
Um, and Svetoslav is asking, um, did this data bank sus and density come from the measurement of each sample? You missed a little bit at the start, I think. Yeah, yeah, yep. absolutely. So we've, we've measured, we've, we, we do it in a very statistically good way. So we will um, get three subsamples and we average all the data. So it's very representative data. Fantastic. And we also have a couple of questions and comments in the chat function. So remember, everybody, if you use the chat, please select um, everyone rather than just the panellists so that everybody can see the questions and the, and the answers. Um, Evgeny says, in your opinion, what is the driving force or the agent of oxidation? Uh, well, uh, you know, Evgeny, you're, you're asking the wrong person uh, chemistry questions, but um, we'll have a chat with you and uh, some more chemistry inspired people in CSIRO down the track, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and Fisco Raseno says, could I request this presentation file if possible? I'm sure we can. Sure. We do make everybody, we do um, record the sessions and Rick will put the recordings up on the GSQ UQ webinar series website. Um, which I have put the, the link for that in the chat function up the start as well. Um, Derek Hoy says, Jim, it is great to see the Uncover Cloncurry work from another perspective and great that you are putting the results in context of the work of Louise Corriveau et al. after last year's um, SGTSG. Really keen to see more work on from CSIRO in Cloncurry. Thank you. Um, all it's good. <laughs> I was Go going to on. say, there's going to be an avalanche over the next year. <laughs> Fantastic. Out, so. I know, we're expecting great things. One more question and then we'll hand over to the next speaker. Steve Micklethwaite is asking, why do you think the system contracts to the oxide portion rather than the core representing the volume of highest fluid flux or rock reaction and the outer zone representing the zone where the fluid is more rock buffered? Oh, this is a, also a chemistry question. Um, yeah, I can't give you a good answer on that. Um, I'm, I'm just basically going off the, um, the zonation of the system. So I'm really looking at it from a, through a geophysical uh, lens. Um, and there's going to be a lot of work between myself and Tobias over the next year to sort of um, get our stories aligned. But Tobias didn't want to um, put his story out there just yet. So this is a bit of, a, a bit yeah. of an in-between story. No, can I uh, put my oar in on that one too, Jim? That the is, I mean, part of it is there's a there's a temporal evolution that that your anisotropic magnetic susceptibility work kind of showed, or at least that was my dim understanding of it. That 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 central core has a you know that it's not just the evolution of exactly the same thing under the same conditions that you've got a uh, you know when you look at Ernest Henry, the central breccia, um, the mineralized zone looks like it's you know paragenetically later than a lot of the a lot of the other more magnetite rich parts of the system. So it is not all happening at the same time and just a representation of varying fluid rock ratio. Yeah, I think you interpreted the question a bit better than I did. Um, 